help, help people become disciples of Jesus. Amen? And a uh, couple pointers. Remember, you always want to help make sure your friend has a readable translation of the Bible. Amen? Uh, sometimes people show up with archaic translations that they can't even understand themselves. So you want to get a, a modern translation for them to read. Secondly, you always want to have, you know, uh, two, three, four people in a Bible study. Going beyond that might be a little bit too much. You don't want to show up, like I said, with ten people, and they're like, am I going to get jumped? Or, you know, you know. Um, I understand as time goes on, and they build more relationships and have friends, that, okay, you know, if they're cool with five, seven of you guys come to their house or whatever, and they've, they've met everybody, uh, but you want to use some wisdom. I, I think two, three is, is a good number of people to have uh, for a Bible study with a, a, a non-Christian. You always want someone there to take notes. And I know it's easy to just kind of screenshot uh, the study or something and send it to them. But I think it shows a lot of love for someone to take the time to write the notes for the person. But I think secondly as well, the, the person taking the notes should be the younger Christian who's learning how to lead the study. Mm -hmm. And, and this is part of how you learn. You get what I'm saying? And so uh, it's not just necessarily for the person who's studying the Bible. It's for the young Christian to be able to uh, internalize it uh, so that they can uh, study the Bible as well with their friends and, uh, from watching you. Uh, you always, of course, want to start every Bible study with a prayer because you want the Holy Spirit involved. And remember, if someone doesn't believe in Jesus, we study the book of John. And how long should a Bible study last? One hour, amen. So I know that's a challenge for some people. But you got to work on not being long-winded. And I think it requires leadership skill because uh, a lot of times, certain, sometimes, I don't know, you ever study the Bible with someone who just talks a lot? Yeah. And, and they, they just, uh, people are looking at each other. Um, and it's like one scripture, you know, it's like 30 minutes. Right. You know what I mean? So, um, sometimes it's good, you, you just have to leave. It's like Bible talk. You have to say, hey, no, I appreciate that thought. Uh, let's come back to that, and we can talk more about that. Let's just finish the study or whatever. You get what I'm saying? You want to you wanna really lead in a powerful way so that you can get done, because... Remember why I said you want to do that. If you, if you start studying the Bible with someone and their first study is three hours long, and then you try to set up the next one, in the back of their mind they're thinking, oh my gosh, I need to set aside three hours of time, or this, this is a lot, versus you want to leave them wanting more, amen? Yeah. And I think it's important to finish the study. The only exceptions, of course, like I said, is when you do the sin confession. Um, that might take a little longer, like darkness of the cross. And again, use what I call, I don't remember what I called it, Spiritual common sense. So, you know, someone's dad died that day or something. Okay, study go a little longer, amen? Uh, you know what I mean? You, you want to be sensitive to whatever's going on uh, in their life. And so every study has an objective, and of course the goal is that you're calling every single person to make a decision based off each scripture. And as I said, if you can remember anything from what I teach you, it's just calling each person you're studying with to decide to obey each scripture. That's the power of the Word of God when there's a decision uh, for obedience. And of course the purpose of the Seeking God study is to get them to commit to the First Principle Study Series. Amen? Say, hey, what do you think about this study at the end? Awesome. Uh, we have about seven more studies, six more studies, or whatever. Uh, would you be, you feel great about continuing to do this and seeking God with your whole heart? And then you set a time and a location. You never want to leave the study without setting a time and a location. Amen? Amen. Now, what was the name of our uh, young uh, non-Christian that we uh, ran over? Kobe. And then, uh, what was the name of our young, zealous uh, Christian? Devin. 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 Amen. <laughs> And so, we meet back up again, maybe this time we meet again at the same coffee shop we met up at last time. And again, he's studying, uh, he decided to take the challenge to study the Bible every day. Because remember, we used the fishing pole technique I taught you about. And uh, the line didn't get too tight, and so we said, all right, let's do a Bible study every single day, amen? So, I go, hey, you know, Jacoby, it's great to, to be here, Kevin, it's good to see you. Um, how to go uh, this morning, taking the challenge to start reading the Bible. Actually, I, I read John 1 and 2, man, I, I just wanted to get into it, it's really fascinating. Come on, man, that's awesome. I go, great job. And then you do some small talk, and you kind of see how they're doing, and if they took the challenge from the last study, and then, of course, you start every study with a prayer. So let's pray. Father God, uh, I just want to pray as a class right now, God, that you give us attentive hearts and minds as we go through the word study tonight. 
Uh, Lord, we're grateful, Father, to become uh, students of your word. And Father, I pray that we can learn this Bible study to be help, able to help our friends effectively uh, build a foundation that is based on the word of God. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, Jacoby, the study today is called The Word of God. And uh, similar to last time, it's a pretty foundational and basic study, but I think it will really pave the way for everything we're going to talk about. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Come on, Mike. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16... The Apostle Paul Jacoby, who was a preacher, is writing to uh, someone he discipled and that he mentored, similar to our relationship that, that, that had this kind of coaching uh, relationship going on. And he writes to Timothy, he says in verse 16, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, Jacoby, when you look at this passage, it says, all scripture is God-breathed. What, what do you think that means when you hear that term? That means God, like, breathed on the Bible, or, or what's that mean? Kind of chuckles, he goes, well, I think it just means that every word came from God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. The Bible is how God speaks to us. And you know, Jacoby, a lot of people want to know, how's God communicate to me today? And you have people that look to nature to figure out if God's speaking to them, or crystals, or claim to hear audible voices, but this scripture is great because it shows us that the word of God is God-breathed. When we get in the Bible, God is speaking to us. Amen? Mm -hmm. For you, Jacoby, do you believe the entire Bible comes from God? He goes, yes, I, I think I'm starting to, to see that. I have some questions, but I fundamentally do. I go, that's great. And we find it's not just a dead history book. You know, for me, Jacoby, I grew up, uh, you know, my dad had a, uh, a, you know, King James Bible that looked pretty nice, kind of set on a little TV shelf there. And, uh, but it just kind of seemed like this, this holy book that a common person like myself couldn't understand, or like Shakespeare or something like that. But we find in this passage that the Bible's actually useful, he says. It's useful for teaching, kind of like what we're doing right here, Jacoby. Correcting, rebuking. Uh, by the way, Jacob, do you know what a rebuke is? He goes, uh, maybe like rebuking a demon or something? I go, well, similar, kind of. A, a, a rebuke is like a harsh correction. Uh, so if uh, my little girl runs in the middle of the street and doesn't look for cars, I, I, I might correct her. If she does it again, I might rebuke her. And I, I, I'm yelling at her. I'm, I'm intense about the situation. Not because I'm mad at her, but because she's in danger. And so that's when a rebuke is necessary. So there may be times, Jacoby, uh, where we have to rebuke one another. We have to sharpen one another with the Word of God because we're going off the wrong path there. It's a harsh, harsher direction. Sometimes discipline's involved. Um, training in righteousness. You know, Jacoby, if you wanted to become a uh, bodybuilder, would you be one tomorrow? Yeah. And he goes, no. I go, yeah, you wouldn't be one tomorrow, but could you make the decision to become one tomorrow? He goes, yeah. I go, exactly. You know, with the Word of God, you're not going to be uh, equipped for every good work tomorrow, but you can make a decision to begin the training. Are you with me right here? Oh, yeah. And uh, I want you, Jacoby, to think of Kevin and I as kind of your spiritual spotters in the gym. Uh, and I want to ask you, are you willing to enter the Lord's gym to be trained for righteousness so that you can be equipped for every good work? And he goes, all right, I'm ready to do it. And I go, amen. Let's move on. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Of course, uh, you take turns reading. You guys know that, so you know. Uh, you go through the study. And so I'd have the next person read. So maybe kind of take this one. Hebrews chapter 4. So we've seen so far the, the Word of God is to be applied to our lives, it's useful, it's not just a, a, an ancient history necessarily, although it does contain ancient history. And in Hebrews 4 and verse 12 it says, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight, everything's uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him, to whom we must give an account. Mm. You know, when you look at this, Jacoby, what do you take from this passage? What do you think it's saying about the Bible? He goes, hmm, I guess that it's really powerful. I go, yeah, it is powerful. In fact, he compares it to a double-edged sword, which back then was one of the most powerful weapons of the time. Now, why would it compare the Bible to such a powerful weapon, Jacoby? He goes, well, I think, um, I guess, 
It's like, I don't really know. Maybe I guess you use it to, it can be used for good and bad. I go, yeah, I think you're on the right track. I go, you think about a sword, what's it do? It goes, kills people. I go, yeah. It, it, it cuts, right? And so the word of God in similar fashion, it cuts. In fact, it says it divides even joints and marrow. Which, you know, you've got your joints, then you've got the marrow on the inside. It, you know, it gets so precise is the point that it's making. Soul and spirit. It, it, it divides the, the emotional part from the spiritual part. This is so precise, the word of God. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And so the word of God cuts. You know, I want you to imagine for a moment, Jacoby, that sadly you go to the doctor and he says, hey, you got some bad news for you. You have cancer. But it's at a stage where if we can perform surgery, we can remove it and you can be healed. And so he says, oh, we're going to take this uh, sharp scalpel and cut you open and remove the surgery. Or nowadays, maybe laser surgery or something, right? What would you do? Jacoby goes, well, I would get the surgery. I go, of course. It would be strange if you were like, no, that seems really painful, so I don't want to go through with that. He goes, yeah, that would make no sense. I go, yeah. But, but that's what people do when the Word of God challenges them. It's, it's cutting them. And the Word of God is there to cut the cancer, the sin out of our lives. Amen. Amen. Now we'll talk more, Jacoby, another study about what sin is. But the point is, is that sometimes surgery hurts, but what's the end result? He goes, oh, healing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Jacoby, in this Bible study, we're going to give you a lot of challenges. In the Bible studies we're going to do in the future, we're going to challenge your very core belief sets. We're going to challenge your very identity and who you are. And I just want you to know it's going to really cause you to wrestle at times. You're going to be tempted to run. But are you willing to be challenged by the Word of God? It is going to meet your healing. You see it comes to the He goes, yeah, let's do it. On a side note for us class, this is very important because you need to set them up so they're not taken aback when you're like just challenging them on random stuff. You've got to let them know it's going to be a challenging study series. Yeah. And you're going to be tempted to run, but, but don't if you want to experience God's powerful healing. And the goal is, I appreciate you accepting this, this challenge, Jugo, because the goal is that one day he says you're going to stand before God and have to give an account. Yeah. And you want all that nasty stuff cut out of you so that you can stand before God right and ready to go. Wow. To heaven. Amen? Amen? Well, let's go to the next passage, 2 Peter chapter 1. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, you know, as you're turning there, you ever heard Jacoby someone say about the Bible, well, it's just kind of up to your own personal interpretation. And he goes, yeah, I think I've actually heard that. I mean, about the Bible, what's kind of what, how you interpret it? I go, well, let's, let's, let's understand what that's talking about. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the will, human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so he starts off, he says, above all. So Jacoby, this is very important. He, if he says above all, that means he wants us to make sure we really understand this. And what do you think he's teaching here from this passage? He goes, I think it's saying that it didn't come from men necessarily, but it came from the Spirit of God. I go, I think you're on the right track. You know, Kevin here is taking notes for you in this Bible study. And what's actually putting the ink on the paper? He goes, uh, Kevin, I go, no, think deeper about it. What, what's actually putting the ink on the paper? He goes, oh, the pen. I go, exactly. Who controls what the pen writes? He goes, Kevin does. And so I go, in the analogy, Kevin would be like the Holy Spirit or God. And the pen would be like the prophet who wrote the Bible. And so God, in his genius, used 40 different prophets, if you will authors over a period of 1,500 to 2,000 years on three different continents, three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and told one story about God. And it was all guided by the Spirit. And these 40 different authors, Jacoby, some were tax collectors, some were fishermen, some were poor homeless prophets in the desert wandering around. A lot of them, not contemporaries, all write about God. And God used their personalities to give his message that we have in our hands. Isn't that pretty awesome? That's amazing. So understand that it didn't originate, though, with their own thinking or their own minds. You know, um, this is important because we all interpret, and my challenge to Kobe is that I grew up, I didn't go to church a lot, you know, much growing up until I went with a friend in elementary school a little bit, but, you know, my, my family came from a Seventh-day Adventist kind of tradition, my mom more from a Methodist-type tradition. 
These influences create these lenses we see the Bible through. And the challenge is for us not to have our own interpretation, but to seek the Holy Spirit's interpretation. And so, Jacoby, I want to challenge you. Are you willing to take your own lenses off and try to seek what God's interpretation of scriptures are? Yeah, let's do that. I go, this is why we have this study group. You want to take these scriptures back home and read the context. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but I like uh, buffets, amen? Amen. They used to have a place called uh, Golden Corral uh, yeah. 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 back uh, in the Midwest. I don't know they have here, but, 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 uh, you know, you go and you can just kind of go in there and, and eat as much as you want. It's pretty awesome. Choose whatever you want. It's very true. Unfortunately, the Bible's not Golden Corral, amen? Yeah. <laughs> and, and sadly, that's what a lot of people do. They're like, I really like this part about heaven. I love this part about God's grace. I love this part about forgiveness. Premarital sex, I don't know. That's probably more of an ancient, ancient people. Thing. My interpretation of that is this. Uh, hell, uh, that's probably more mythology. Probably comes from the Greek Titan or something. You know, what? people come up with crazy stuff, right? And so, Jacoby, the challenge is, is it's either all or nothing, amen? And he says, above all, no scripture came from man's interpretation. Are you with me here, Jacoby? He goes, yes, amen. All right, well, let's go to John chapter 8. Oh, come on. Come on, Mike. John chapter 8 and verse 31. And I believe it's my turn. Uh, verse 31 says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. You know, Jacoby, it wasn't uh, Lincoln who first said that. It was Jesus. Amen. Oh. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is a pretty cool verse because, you know, in context, who's he actually talking to? And Jacoby looks down and he says, oh, to the Jews. I go, exactly. I don't know how much you know about the Bible, Jacoby, but uh, Jews, do they normally believe in Jesus? He goes, oh, no. But these ones, they did. They had a, 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 a faith, if you will, in what he was saying. And yet, Jesus goes on and he says, to be my disciples, what do you have to do? And Jacoby goes, oh, you've got to actually hold to the teaching. You've got to abide in his word. I go, exactly. So they weren't really true believers, even though they intellectually believed. And so we learn here that intellectual faith is not enough to save you. You actually have to practice the word of God. Amen? Amen. And so Jacoby, he says that if you hold to his teaching, meaning you actually know the teaching of Jesus. So to hold to something, you got to actually know the teaching first. That's why we're doing these Bible studies. But then, if you hold to the teachings, what's the promise that he says is going to happen? He goes, oh, you'll be set free. I go, set free from what? Same thing. He thinks about it. A lot of people say things like, oh, you know, set free to have a purpose or from this world system. And, you know, they make it really, like, deep. And I go, well, let's look, you know, context, verse 34. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. He goes, you're going to be set free from your sin. And this is where I personally, I get a little personal in the study. I, I say, you know, for me... I was taught by my parents that if you believe, you should believe in God. And so I thought that was enough. That was just kind of my whole concept. I never really read the Bible uh, in elementary school a lot or anything like that. And so uh, I was kind of surprised when I started studying the Bible when I turned 12 and started getting into middle school and I'm realizing, wow, you know, Jesus actually expects us to obey the word of God and to practice it. And for me, I was dominated by all kinds of sins. And I'll, I'll share about the lying that I did, the pornography. I'll share about the uh, uh, hatred that I had uh, towards uh, family members and, and things like that. You know, not Anthony. Your family. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that growing up, you get what I'm saying? And so when I studied the Bible, that God freed me from all that stuff. And so you want to share a little bit, uh, again, don't turn it into some light darkness study or something like that, but just a couple brief points of things that uh, God freed you from. And I like to ask, and I say, hey, you know, Jacoby, is there anything in your life that you feel like just held back by? And just see what they say. You know, maybe they won't say much at that point. It's okay. It's early on in the study series. But you, you always want to try to create more vulnerability in the studies as you go on so there can be trust and connection by the time you get some Come on, more bro. challenging uh, Bible studies. Yeah. You know, ultimately... What's going to set us free, Jacob? He goes, truth. You know, truth is, is just a fact. It's just true or not. And we live in a time where people are trying to get rid of absolute truth mm -hmm. and trying to make everything 
uh, whatever you think or whatever's true for you or some social construct or whatever. And the reality is, is that truth is laid out clearly in the Bible. So we like to use the football analogy, you know. If you saw someone, uh, you know, seemingly make a touchdown and the athlete's, you know, doing the victory dance, he's fired up, the crowd even's going wild, but then the ref calls a play, they show the instant replay, he actually just missed the touchdown. What was the truth? Did he make a touchdown or not? Oh, no. no. But what did he think? He did. So we learned that sincerity doesn't equal truth. You can sincerely think you're right, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're, you're true. Religious people can be wrong, Jacob. And this is why we need to study the Bible and find out if we made the touchdown or not. Amen. So, Jacoby, are you, are you ready to make a decision to hold on to Jesus' teachings? He goes, absolutely. Well, let's go on. One of the things that can uh, really prevent us from that, Jacoby, is tradition. Let's read about this in Matthew 15. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. Yes. Matthew 15. And uh, verse 1. It says, Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what they might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You know, Jacoby, I'm going to break this down in a moment, but why do you think Jesus, is, he seems kind of upset here. What, what do you gather? He goes, um, I guess it sounds like they were being hypocritical, maybe. I go, yeah, I think you're on the right track. You know, back then, um, a tradition had started of the ceremonial washing of hands that was nowhere commanded in the Old Testament and yet had been passed down for so long because essentially what had happened was there had been this kind of belief or this superstition that you could get this demon, if, if, you, if you ate your food without with unclean hands, a demon might get on your food and then you would eat it and become demon possessed. And so Jesus teaches, you know, this is just not true, this is a tradition. But the tradition was held so strong that they tried to call out Jesus on this tradition. And Jesus goes in verse 3, well, why are you breaking what the Bible says, what the Word of God says, to follow a tradition. And he goes, you guys don't even follow one of the commandments. Honor your father and mother. And they had a practice back then called Corbin where essentially they'd give money to the temple treasury and they'd say, hey, this money is devoted to you, God. Take care of my family. But they wouldn't actually lift a finger to do it, thus their own hypocrisy. Back then you didn't have, you know, retirement homes and things like this. So he says, here's the deal. You know, when you worship a tradition that supersedes the Word of God. So not all traditions are bad, Jacoby, but it's when they contradict the Word of God, when they supersede the Word of God. He goes, five things happen to you, and you'll want to know this for the quiz. One, in verse six, you nullify the Word of God. So to nullify the Word of God uh, means kind of like nullifying a check or something. It makes it void. It's useless. So you can know the entire Bible. You have a PhD in Bible, study theology, and if you follow a tradition, it means nothing. Free of text. Followed by the word of God, number one. Number two, uh, you become a hypocrite in verse seven. Number three, when we worship by tradition, in verse eight, we give God lip service. Number four, our heart is far from God. So we're not close to God when we worship by tradition. Number five, in verse nine, our worship's in vain. Meaning, again, it's, it's useless. Ultimately, so number one, nullify the word of God. Two, hypocrisy. Three, lip service. Four, your heart's far from God. And five, your worship's in vain. And I'll go back over that at the end. But ultimately at the end of verse nine, when you look at this, Jacoby, who are people really following? And he looks down and goes, oh, human teachings, human rules. Can be translated, same word for doctrine there, human doctrines. Well, we don't want to follow human doctrines. And I want to give you a challenge, uh, Jacoby. I want to give you what we call the shelf challenge. I want you to imagine there's a bookshelf every time we study the Bible. I want you to take everything you grew up believing about Christianity and religion that grandma and grandpa taught you, pastor, back at home, whatever. Take it all, put it on the shelf for a moment. As we look in the Bible, if there's something on the shelf that's in the Bible, that's a good thing. We can take that back with us. Amen? 
And so, oh, Grandma taught me to believe in Jesus. It says believe in Jesus here in the Bible. I'm going to take that one back with me. Amen? Amen. If there's something on the shelf that's not in the Bible, should we take that back with us? No. No. So that's probably a tradition. So we want to, we want to leave that there. Um, are you willing, Jacoby, to take the shelf challenge? And there may be times where I tell you, hey, I think you're reaching for the shelf. So this is good to have in the study. When we do studies going forward, I'm going to tell you if I think you're reaching for the shelf. Okay? Um, and you'll have to prove to me whether you are or not by looking at the Bible. But, but, but here's the thing. Are you willing to change a tradition that you've always held on to if you saw a contradict the Bible? And he goes, yes. Now, here's the most important part that I think a lot of people don't do. You need to ask them this question. You know, Jacob, I appreciate you agreeing to this challenge. I said the Bible with a lot of people, though, that say they'll follow that challenge, but then when it comes down to it, they don't. Mm -hmm. Even when they know it's not in the Bible. So here's my question. Why do you think someone would not give up a tradition, even if they saw it was in the Bible? And it puts it on him to think a little bit, and usually they all come to the same answer and go, I guess maybe family pressures, persecution. I go, yeah. Great question. You know, some people I know that have studied the Bible have been disowned by their families because it is renouncing a faith that they're coming from, even in Christian though, right? So you just want to have a good talk with them about this because you're really setting them up for success in this Bible study. You've already set them up to take challenges. You've set them up to understand that their doctrine is going to be challenged. Um, and you're doing it in a way that's going to really help them have a good foundation instead of just flying through it real quick. You get what I'm saying? So let's move on and talk a little bit about doctrine now. So now we've talked about what doctrine is. Doctrine just means what you believe or your teaching. So we're going to look at this in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Doctrine's your teaching, what you believe. Um, and, of course, our doctrine should come from the Bible. Now, as you turn in there, I want to ask you, Jacoby, what do you think is more important, the way you live your life or your doctrine, what you believe? And he goes, um, I guess most people, when I say it, they say, oh, I think the way you live, right? Because we've been emphasizing that. you got to live it, right? How should you live it? I go, that's a good thought, but let's look at this. Look at 1 Timothy 4, verse 16. It says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your ears. So which one does the Bible say is more important, your life or your doctrine? And he goes, oh, I guess both. I go, exactly. It's kind of a trick question there. But life and doctrine closely. A lot of people, Jacoby, want to know, what's going to determine whether I'm saved or not when I stand before God? What's going to happen the final day? How do I know? And this scripture tells us two things. The way you live and what you believe is essential. So, Jacoby, if you have a good moral person that lives a better Christian life than you and I do. They're help, helping charities, helping the poor. But let's pretend something's wrong in their doctrine. They don't believe Jesus is the Christ or something like that. Or they don't believe something that the Bible teaches. Are they going to make it? I always put it on them. I guess not, according to this. On the flip side, what if they believe everything the Bible says, but they don't live according to it? He goes, oh, I guess, yeah, that person wouldn't make it either. They're inseparable. It's kind of like two wings to an airplane. You need both to fly. And he says, the importance of this is that you've got to watch your life and doctrine so you'll save yourself first. And then what's the promise? What else are you going to do? So you'll save your ears. Those, that your ears are those who hear you. But to use the airplane analogy again, it's kind of like, you know, they talk about these oxygen masks that drop down, right? Um, which I guess I've heard only has happened, like, very rarely. Maybe never, 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 I don't remember. But anyway. They talk about these oxygen masks that drop down, and they tell you, you put it on your kid first or yourself first? Yeah. Yourself, right? Because you want to save yourself. You're trying to put it on your kid, and you pass out, and you don't get it on, and then both you and the kid die. Yeah. Um, but he goes, no, put it on yourself first. So, you know, in these studies, as we go through this, Jacoby, you're going to be tempted to be thinking about every single person that, that you know, how are you going to get this out to everybody? Mm -hmm. Just first work on yourself. Mm -hmm. And let's focus on getting yourself right with God. Again, you don't want to start using safe and lost language yet because you haven't done the discipleship. You don't know what they're smart. But let's just first work on getting you strong spiritually. And then you're going to be able to help other people get right spiritually with God. Amen? Amen. Well, let's move on. Let's go to Acts 17. I want to give you a, a, a challenge again. We read this, Jacoby, in the last study. But now we've been talking about the Word of God and we see its importance. In Acts 17 and verse 10.
A side note, because I am a man of grace, if you missed the quiz coming here, you're here, uh, you can uh, talk to your team captain and let them give it to you. And uh, it, it, you can count that. The team captain just lets Stephanie know to change the score. Come on, my God. Come on, my all right, Acts 17 and verse 10, it says, As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Amen. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Jacoby, remember we studied this last time, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but remember in verse 11 we gave you the 3E challenge. So, again, you should have already followed up with him to see how it went at the beginning of the study. Um, if they hadn't been reading their Bible, let's pretend they did Seeking God last week and now you're doing the Word. And you ask them how it went at the beginning and they're like, oh, I haven't started yet or whatever. I will usually still do the Word study. Because the Seeking God study, the whole point is just to get them to commit to studying the Bible. After this study, if we get together again in discipleship, and they're like, I'm not reading my Bible, well, we're just going to hold things there, and we're going to challenge them to read the scriptures, amen? And they might need someone to have quiet times with them, and it, you know, does that make sense? Yes. Because you don't want to move on if they're not taking the challenges from each study, because then you're going to make a really weak Christian when they get baptized. And, and we've seen that happen. That's not good. You get what I'm saying. So make sure that they're taking these challenges. But the thing I point out in this is that they examined what Paul said, and they compared it to what, Jacob? He goes, the scriptures. The test of every single religious person is whether what they say comes from the word of God. And this is why you need to review the scriptures that are being given to you so that you can build deep convictions on the Bible to make sure that that's what you believe. Yeah. They did not have books back then. They had scrolls, codexes, and all that would come out here in the, in the next few years. But uh, these guys literally would go to the synagogues every day just to go read the scrolls and make sure what compare what, what Paul was saying. Is that pretty intense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have Bibles just sitting in our living rooms. Yeah. And so, so this is a, this is really challenges us that we've got to have the heart to do whatever it takes to get in the Word of God. Um, remember, the Bible, Jacoby, is how God speaks to you. So, if I just ignore my wife and don't talk to her for a day. How do you think that's going to go, Jacoby? <laughs> probably not good. That's probably going to be really bad. She'll probably call, you know, or something. Or, or do, you know, think something's wrong, you know what I mean? Uh, a week goes by. Now we're really in trouble. Oh, no. Someone's sitting on the couch or something. I don't know. I have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, that's what but, you know. <laughs> then, let's, and then let's pretend uh, I don't talk, there's no communication for a month. At some point without communication, there's going to cease to be a relationship, is my point. And, and you have people that claim to be true Christians and don't talk to God or listen to God every day. And so, Jacoby. I don't believe you can be a true Christian and, and, and not read your Bible daily. Right. Amen. I'm not talking about something legalistic. You get, you, you get what I'm saying. Like, in general, this needs to be the, the, the common thing. So here's my challenge, is you got to really be in the Bible every day. You might need to go back and talk about what they're reading and help break down some things. To have, you want to set them up for success at a quiet time, because remember, most people guys have never had a quiet time. Yeah. And so I try to keep it simple. I just say, hey, just read a section and ask yourself a few questions. What's it say about God? What's it say about me, and what's it say about the world? Amen. 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 And that's it. You know what I mean? You just want to give them some basics to start off. You don't want to talk about, you know, exegesis and all that. Amen. All right. Yeah, Blue Letter Bible, download this. You don't want to get all that. You know what I mean? That, 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 that will come along. All right, let's go to James chapter 1 here. So you notice we're about done. It's only been 45 minutes, really, of the Bible study. And so these studies don't need to take a long time. You know what I'm saying? And I've added, you guys got to understand, I've been giving you kind of a whole picture of everything. I've added a bunch of stuff. I don't even say everything I'm always saying right up here. Does that make sense? Because, um, you know, you're just kind of trying to meet the person's needs and get them to take the general challenge. And you'll have your own little, you know, analogies or things you've heard that you can throw in. And I think that's good. 
All right, James chapter 1, in verse 22. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Gosh, Kobe, you remember, what's the term blessed be? It's a perlatively happy. Go ahead. Exactly. In the New Testament, it's happy. Amen? Hebrew word superlatively happy. And he says here that the way you're going to find freedom is by practicing the word of God. You know, it's not a matter of just hearing it. In fact, Jacoby, you're kind of in a very dangerous position right now. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, you're in danger. And, you know, he gets a little like, what are you talking about? I go, well, you're hearing the word of God. The Bible says if you hear the word of God, you are opening yourself up to being totally deceived. If you don't practice it. Oh, wow. This is why people go to church on Christmas and Easter and think they're okay. Yeah. I'm hearing the word of God. So I'm a good person. You get what I'm saying? But the reality is, is that he says, you've got to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. So, you know, it's kind of like Nike slogan, just do it. Just do it. This, this is the Nike verse, you know, just do it. And he compares the Bible here to a mirror. You know, uh, a, a lot of us, we like to look in the mirror a lot, amen? You're a Mecca, you're looking at car windows. <laughs> Sisters, you know, walk the, the window comes by and just kind of look. <laughs> There's not a day that goes by we don't look in the uh, mirror. I mean, it'd be weird if we didn't. How much more should we read our Bible every day? You know? Because, you know, if, if you were to wake up and you looked in the mirror, Jacoby, and you saw a bunch of boogers and dirt and, you know, high gunk and stuff, your hair's all messed up and all this stuff. And, uh, uh, and uh, you just kind of, you know, walk away and you forget. And then you go to, you know, class or work or something and everyone's like, you okay? What happened to this guy? That's stupid, right? The reality is if you see something, you have a responsibility, you go you clean it up. Yeah. And so, Jacoby, you're going to look into the spiritual mirror, you're going to see gunk, things that need cleaned up, and we have a responsibility to practice them. Are you ready to be a doer of the word, not just a doer? Mm -hmm. All right, let's do it. Amen. So we want to close in John 12. And this is uh, ultimately why this Bible study is so important. In John chapter 12, and I like to start in verse 47. It says, if anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words which I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. Amen. Did Jesus come to judge the world or to save the world? Save. Save. Save it. He wants every single person saved. Come on. Come on. You know, God is, is so loving, and, and he heaven's love, God's love for the world, is it's inclusive. He wants everyone to be saved. Heaven, unfortunately, is exclusive. And so he goes in verse 48, there is a judge for the one who rejects me. What does he say is that judge? And he looks down and he says, oh, the very words he spoke. I go, exactly. So his words will judge us on the last day, amen. Now, some people try to get creative and, you know, you see, Jesus isn't the judge. The Bible's the judge. The guys, it's all the same thing, okay? You know, so, so you know, it's like, it's like, I can show you a verse literally that says Jesus the judge in John, a couple chapters later. Yeah. Okay, so don't, don't, don't think you're tricky or that's some kind of revolutionary insight. Uh, the, the reality is he's making a point here that, that his heart is he doesn't want to judge anybody. I've come to love everybody. But I'm going to judge everyone fairly by what I said. God's a God of integrity. Come on. And so I kind of think of the final day of judgment, Jacoby, as, as God's going to take, you know, you imagine maybe a scale or something, you know, the word of God in your life and go, did he accept my words? Amen. You're, you're in it. If you rejected it, I'm sorry, uh, you're lost. And I like to use the analogy, um, you know, think about a college professor who you come to class and 
the professor goes, hey guys, this semester, um, you don't have to come to class the entire time. And everyone's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's like, I'm just going to give you a textbook, and he passes out a textbook, and he goes, just come back in on the last day of the semester, and we're just going to have a pass-fail exam. No A, B, C, you know, I mean, they're just going to pass or fail. If you study the book, he goes, you'll be fine, you'll pass the class. So if you're serious about that class, Jacoby, what are you going to do? I'm going to study the book. Now let's pretend Jacoby had a, a terrible semester that semester. Um, maybe someone in his family died that was supporting him financially. He had to take another job and, and start working. And his girlfriend dumps him and injures himself on the football team. Just has a really hard semester. He's really busy. Um, then one day he wakes up and he's like, oh my gosh, today's the day of that exam. And runs to the exam, you know, and comes in and sits down and the test is right there and he's just kind of staring at it. I don't know if you've ever had one of those experiences where you kind of just, everyone like looks like they know what's going on and you're like the only one who does it. And uh, so he goes up to the teacher and he just begs him and says, hey, can you just, can you just let me pass the class. I, I, you don't understand. I, my, my, my family member died and I had to take an extra job and it was so busy. And these are just professors. You just kind of let them pass without doing anything? No. No. And I think a lot of people think God's like that. Yeah. They're going to get up there and go, well, I had, you don't understand God, I had a really tough, so-and-so got COVID, and this, this was really hard, and I didn't have time, I had to work, and you don't understand, school was so much for me, and all this kind of stuff. And that God's like, oh, really? Okay, come on in. <laughs> That's the world we live in. Um, the reality is God is fair, and he's just. He goes, you have the textbook. And more than a textbook, we don't only just have to study it, we have to live it, amen? Yeah. Um, we have to live it. And so the Bible is going to be the judge. Now, the human analogy only works so far. A, a, a teacher might, you know, go, let me give you an extra week or something or whatever. You know what I'm saying? But, but God has to be fair to what his Bible says and to what the Word of God says. And so I guess my final question for you, Jacoby, and this is how you want to end the study, is are you willing to allow the Word of God to be the final authority Above emotions, traditions, family, to be the final authority for your life. That's good. And he goes, I am. Amen. If at any point they're not willing to, at that point, you, you, you want to you go back and revisit it. This is very important. You really can't move on to the discipleship study if they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. Yeah. And so, sound good? Yeah. Amen. That's the Word of God study. Okay, guys, so for the quiz next time, you'll want to write this down.